Josh, why are we sitting in a boxing ring? Well, we're in Columbus, Ohio. My wife and I just moved here about a year and a half ago. We moved back from LA, where I was for about seven years, and she was for probably 14 years. I wanted a place that I just, I didn't have to leave the house. And so, if I didn't have a boxing ring here, I would have to leave the house. <laughs> so, uh, put in a boxing ring. Um, it's right outside of the studio. So, figured, what a great place to talk about the studio right behind us uh, than in the boxing ring right outside of it. You lived in Columbus for your entire childhood, correct? Yeah, I was born and raised in Columbus, and uh, we started touring, and then I met a girl. And she lived in LA. I'd never lived outside of Columbus. I never really planned on moving. You know, people leave their, leave their home city, home state, because they're just like tired of it, or sick of it, or, or hate it. And that was never the case for me. I've always loved this city, but I was, I was excited to try something new for a bit. So then we make the transition, we move out to Los Angeles, and we created a studio for you, more of a, just a studio in a box. We didn't create the room, we just put up some treatment and then gave you all the gear that was necessary to track. But I think it's really cool that we're back in Columbus. Once we uh, thought about moving, and I had the studio at the house there, it's kind of like, you know, you, you get something and then you can't really go back from that. And I was like, how am I gonna have a place without a studio? I, I think that's when the conversation started, is kind of just imagining living in a, a different place without kind of my drum world. Right. It's a multifaceted studio that addresses obviously drums, but do you want to get into some of the other elements too that the studio is capable of you know, yeah. operating in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my wife also, uh, she, she does acting. And so, uh, you know, big, a big part of um, what she does is after any TV show or movie is done, uh, there's a process called ADR. It's either replacing dialogue or adding dialogue after the after everything's been shot. Sometimes they'll change a line completely once everything's done. I wanted to be able to have the ability and the control to do all of that in here as well. Not only that, but um, you know, Debbie does a podcast, and so we would record that in the studio in LA. So you know, we were like, hey, let's let's create you know an opportunity to. Um, record a podcast here, maybe even do video podcasts, and you can plug the mic right in, it's patched, you enable that mic, and you're good to go. That was fun in the creation of the studio, it was like, it was almost like another phone call, it was like, hey, we forgot one more thing, it's like, we, we gotta do ADR, and then yeah. a week later, it's like, oh yeah, the podcast. So there was just more and more wall plates that we were putting in the studio, but we had the opportunity to personalize the studio in every way to make it functional for you and your needs, and it, it's great that it's a tracking room for drums, we made it set up so we could do ADR, and then also the podcast in the back wall. I know when you had called me and we started talking about the personal nature of the room, it was weird, you, you kept sending images from Instagram, you're like, yeah. hey, I like this, I like this component, I like this element. And I was, I, I think it really, we started getting ideas from Instagram and other studios. I've been working with Gavin Haverstick of Haverstick Designs, and one thing that I love utilizing him for is because he's not like a cookie cutter studio builder. What I mean by that is there's a lot of builders who build studios that it's kind of like there's a template that they follow and you can almost identify who the builder is by the end result. Gavin and I have been working together for years and one thing I love on an artist side is he goes off of the personal requests of whoever we're working with. It's not like there's a trademark Haverstick studio. It's just always personalized to every detail that was required from the artist. In working with you, I realized instantly with the aesthetic nature that we were going for that we needed someone with Gavin's personal touch. Hi, Jim. Hey, Jim. Good boy. You know, we've been involved in the project for a while and, and uh, kind of going through different options and design elements. Um, it started all with TJ from, from Neat. You know, he got us involved in the project and introduced me to you and um, kind of started from there, uh, going around to some different houses and taking a look at some options. So. Yeah. Weirdly enough, there was uh, a bunch of septic lines uh, on the areas that we were trying to build a studio and nothing really worked out. And then we found this space, and I know that initially we talked about building an external structure here, and then that kind of evolved because we were just like, well, there's kind of plenty of space in, inside yeah. here. There's like a kid's playroom in there, and then this room, oddly enough, had a drum set in it when we came <laughs> to, uh, when we, Debbie and I walked through the house the first time, and then it kind of turned into this room behind us. I remember early on we even designed some exterior structure, just basic mm -hmm. layouts. I remember the live room initially we had put a rock climbing wall in. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but yeah, That's it's right. uh, um, 
it just made more sense once you got this house. It was there's a kind of ready-made spot for the studio, and there wasn't a whole lot of design changes. We came up with an initial concept. You wanted a control room, a drum room, and a, and a vocal booth, and it just kind of fit like a, a puzzle in there. It was, yeah. it was really, really nice. So we're here in the control room. Obviously, the first thing you see is the aesthetics, and that was all designed with the help of, of Josh and Debbie uh, and our renderings and dialing that in and, and getting the look and feel the way that we wanted it to. The first thing you'll see is, is the centralized location for the mix position here, and, and you want symmetry in a control room. When we designed this space, uh, we canted out the walls and gave them some angles so that first reflection points were, were minimized and also widened the room just because control rooms are always the spot where people congregate the most. It's almost like the kitchen of uh, your, when you have a party at home. So we wanted to make it big enough to feel comfortable, uh, but also angling the walls helps acoustically. Um, so we modeled that out doing ray tracing and making sure that we optimize those angles. This room was a lot of fun for me because he gave me control over what kind of equipment we wanted in regards to preamps, compressors, and converters. Let's start with the chassis first. Everything is inside of a Danger Fox desk. Shout out to Aaron. You were immensely helpful in us uh, getting this desk in time. It's a mastering style desk, but we loved it because it gave Josh the ability to reach everything at his fingertips without having to move around in the room. It's quick and easy for a one-man show. As far as gear is concerned, we have a lot of Neve in the desk, simply due to the fact that Josh and I started going through some of his favorite albums and some of his favorite drum tones, and we found more often than not, there was Neve involved in the tracking process. So I've got a bunch of 517s, 511s, and 1073s in this desk. On the top left of the desk, I've got a BAE 1073. Just a classic vocal preamp and an amazing DI. So I just had to have one in the studio for him and I wanted it to be a tool at his fingertips. Neve Shelford was the second choice. Um, I've got the Neve Shelford actually patched into the drum room as a ADR preamp for Debbie. When she comes in here to do all of her voiceover, I just wanted a clean, concise preamp for her and to have EQ and compression at his fingertips, uh, just to hit it on the tracking side and incoming, just to sweeten the sound, if you will. Going into the preamps for the drum set, we've got a number of 511s, and then I've got a couple 517s in there as well. I've got the 517 on kick in and snare top just to have a little dynamic control, and then the rest is all ran 511. We'll go over the drum setup here in a second, but I've got two Coles 4038s as overhead over the entire kit, and I've got those running in the 511s, out of 511s into the 1176s that you see behind me, and then that just goes obviously into the conversion. At the top of the middle section, it's not really studio related as much as it is uh, for all the stuff we do on the road. It's a distriplizer, and it is basically just a time code reader. We embed Simpty time code into all of our playback tracks for lighting cues, pyro, and everything that we do live, and Josh works on those tracks in the studio. So I put a distriplizer in the center so he can make sure that time code is scrolling and adequately inputted into the session. Josh, not being a guitar player, but still having people that will come over to play guitar, I wanted him to have a Kemper in here. It's just my go-to. It sounds fantastic, and it's a great asset and a tool for anyone in the studio. The studio is based around PMC 6.2s and a 6.1 sub. We chose the PMC because of the built-in DSP into the speaker. I didn't want to put a Trinov or an Intonato in front of the speakers, and I could utilize the DSP built into the PMCs to create, actually, zones in this room. Josh's mix position, obviously flat, but I wanted to create a separate zone for the couch. So if he had friends, management, label, what have you come over, I wanted to be able to set a separate EQ curve to kind of just heighten that experience for the couch listening environment, if you will. Lynx were a 24N uh, as a conversion. I've had Lynx with Josh since the beginning when we built his first studio, it was all Lynx based. And then Tyler as well as all Lynx in his studio. So I just wanted everyone to have the same converters on the front and back side. Grace M905, my go-to monitor controller of choice. Beyond that, the other really cool aspect of this studio, and again, we spoke about it earlier, I wanted this studio to be a turnkey solution, literally. We're using a Furman power sequencer. You literally just turn the key and everything boots up in sequence and down in sequence to make sure you're not getting any pops, clicks. But the important part is there's power boxes behind every speaker, the subwoofer, and the desk that makes it so literally every single thing turns on with one turn of a key. There's a lot of LED lights in this room. It allows us to do a lot of color changing to set the mood. And Josh was really big on that from the get-go, wanting to make sure that we were able to tailor the room however we wanted it to be, uh, given his mood that day. You know, so we can uh, turn them all blue or turn them red. You know, there's there's infinite number of colors that we could we could choose from. On the back wall here, we've got a QRD um, diffuser that 
Actually, we designed it, um, but uh, Griffey Construction did, did all of the uh, construction of it. So we gave them the mathematical pattern, and uh, him and his crew went to work and, and fabricated it on site here. The next thing that, that happened after we kind of like came up with a design plan, a design element, was we get, we, we get a local contractor to be able to kind of execute this. I didn't know how any of this worked either. I'm like, so what's Gavin gonna come in and cut down my walls or <laughs> like put up walls? And so then we realized that, that Gavin's kind of the, the mastermind behind, you know, the kind of the architect of the whole thing. And then we need a contractor to come in and do all the, you know, kind of make it happen, follow those blueprints and those plans that, um, that Gavin came up with. And this guy, Charlie, came in and he was really, he was, he was beyond thorough. And uh, he was like, why don't I come in and I'll just kind of poke around in this, you know, kind of cut some holes and make sure there's no like major structural things that would prevent us cutting, breaking down walls or adding walls or whatever. He's like, I'll just come in and do that for free. <laughs> I think he called Gavin once or twice and was like, hey, I was looking on page 403 of your blueprints and I found something that I didn't make, make total sense. And so after all that, we were like, I think it was kind of, this is the guy that should do it. I'm here with Charlie Griffey, who uh, was the contractor on building this studio. I remember you, you told me that you'd never done a studio before, which I thought was cool, um, because I think you still kind of exhibited so much sort of uh, confidence and pride in your work. I just really studied the plans and wanted to make sure I kind of somewhat knew what I was talking about. I mean, with first time I got the opportunity, I, I knew I wanted to do it and I knew I wanted to be involved and be a part of it, so. Over the seven months or so that it took to kind of get this thing from start to finish, uh, I think we became friends. You were at my house pretty much every day for seven months. Um, Saw you in concert. Yep, yeah, I came out to, uh, where did, where did he go? Kansas City. Kansas City, he came out to Kansas City. Yeah. No, he was incredibly detailed and the timing was perfect. I mean, working close with Charlie allowed me to know when my team was gonna come in because basically Gavin had set everything in motion. Charlie built the structure and then once we got to the framing side of things, that's when I brought in my team. Uh, and it's, it's great, my team was actually Sweetwater. Uh, I brought in my sales engineer, John Kremple, and then I brought in another friend of mine that's also a sales engineer at Sweetwater, his name's Patrick Cobley. Uh, we came in one day after Charlie had set the framework and we had pulled all the cables, and then after the next weekend, we had came and soldered everything. But we'll talk about the cathedral room later, but we had pulled the W2 mass connect and just working on a time frame because everything had to happen at a very specific time and Charlie was great about scheduling all of that. And then we bring in Matt Call from Simplified Acoustics. He was the one that, correct me if I'm wrong, he was the one who wrapped all of the walls in the cloth, right? Yes. With this vocal booth here that we have, um, it, it's kind of multi-purpose. It's for uh, voiceover work, but it also, it's his, his brother's office. They, they play Warzone in there and Call of Duty, different things. One of the coolest elements in there, besides all the stretch fabric systems, very darker feel than any of the other spaces. Uh, but then there's also this, this custom fiber optic ceiling. Simplified Acoustics, uh, Matt Call and his crew uh, specialize in doing these ceilings. And uh, one thing that they do that other uh, companies a lot of times don't is that this, the fiber optic strands are cut at different heights so that when it's dark in there, you actually see some depth to the stars versus them all being at one single height. We've got wall plates around the entire studio and there's one behind these two screens here to my right. Uh, shout out to Zane and Jumpers. Jumpers is responsible for all the wall plates in the studio and every single cable that we ran. Josh, once again, not being a vocalist, we built this room in case vocalists came over. We're gonna have a couple amps come in here shortly. Um, so this is, again, one of those rooms that we wanted to have in the studio just in case we needed it. I remember when Matt was done and it came time for gear day, as I'll call it. What was fun for me on this project specifically is, you know, a lot of studios that I build, you get tasked with a job, you come in, you put all the equipment, you make sure that it's running, and then at the end of the day, your client, artist, whoever you're building the studio for, comes in and observes the job done. What was unique about this project was working with you. And I know you're a gear guy, and I know that you enjoy the environment, but your involvement in actually building the studio with you, it kind of feels like it brings you even more involved and closer to this project. You know, when, when we kind of outfitted that studio in LA, like you said, it was kind of, it was kind of already uh, an environment kind of ready for that, but then you being far away, I remember I just, I just got a big shipment of gear, <laughs> including a desk that I had to put together. We worked on it together. Uh, here's how you patch this, and then you run the snake over to your drums, and 
all this you know, patching and labeling and, and then patch cables, all that stuff, was a big learning process, but really fun and also I think really important for me as somebody who mostly self-engineers in here uh, to be able to kind of know how to get things up and running. And if something's not working, I can troubleshoot it as much as I possibly can before having to call you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy kind of understanding the flow of everything and, and how it all works um, so that I can kind of just come down here by myself and power everything up and get it, get it running and being able to just record and know that it's going to work. Welcome to the drum room. Josh, would it be safe to say this is your favorite room? Um, in my house, before I had this, it was my bedroom. <laughs> um, yes. But now it's this room. Very good. Yeah, I love this room, obviously the aesthetic nature of it. Uh, a lot of personal touches. This is the artwork done by Dabs Myla. It's also the same art that we have up in, we call it the cathedral room? Or? Yeah, sunroom, cathedral room, tall room. But the artwork continued down here and I'm bringing up the artwork because it was a very important design element from my perspective. Uh, when I was bringing in all the hardware to set up for the microphones, I did not want to get in front of the entire kit with a bunch of mic stands. So shout out to Triad Orbit, really walked me through the process of what I would need to make a very minimal footprint in regards to the hardware. Uh, quickly addressing the overhead mics, we have them permanently suspended from the ceiling with Triad Orbit stands, and then Triad Orbit is also around the whole kit. One mic stand on the snare top bottom and that stand is also holding the hi-hat mic. I've got one stand holding the two toms, tom, the top tom and floor tom one, and then kicked off of the crash on, on the right side of the kit, I have the third floor tom mic'd up. 421s on all the toms, 57 top and bottom snare, and a sure pencil condenser on the hi-hats, Audix D6, and then I want to give a shout out to Solomon Mics. Uh, I reached out to Henry from Solomon and asked him if he could do a low freak mic and also the phone freak mic, um, but wrap it in the same kind of material that we would have on the kit. Again, the lengths that Josh went to to make this room aesthetically pleasing, I did everything I could to keep a minimal footprint from a stand perspective and also get custom wrapped microphones where applicable. Can I also say that I didn't know what the drums looked like at the time, and neither did Solomon. <laughs> um, and so when he, he kind of just, I think we said like a natural wood, and right. he did that. Then I sent the photo over to Mike from SJC, and he was like, this is unbelievable. That's actually completely perfect yeah. with how the drums look right now. So a, that, was, that was a coincidence. Absolute home run. We've got a Royer SF12 stereo ribbon that's on the front side of the room that you can't see right now. But overheads, four, Coles 4038, and between that ribbon, this room just, we can make it as dead as we want or we can make it come alive. So I'm really excited to hear drum samples come out of this room. The drums are made by a company called SJC Drums. Uh, I've been working with them since probably 2012 or early 13, uh, when we were still playing clubs. In my last home studio, I just, you know, I would pull in kits that I had on, on the road. For this one, I called Mike and I said, I want a drum set that's specifically for this room. We'll probably never leave this room. I'll never tour with it. I just want to record right. with it. And I want it, to, I want it to sound good above anything else. So this one, we kind of, we sat and we talked. I said, you know, I, I said, first and foremost, I, I want this one to sound good. Not that they don't all sound <laughs> good, but specifically for this room. Right. And we talked on the phone for 45 minutes, kind of brainstorming what we wanted it to look like and, and feel like. And then yeah, probably halfway through, I was kind of like, you know, Debbie loves tree houses, my wife. She loves the idea of a tree house. I proposed in a tree house in New Zealand. Uh, we kind of look at this house as a tree house a little bit. We're surrounded by trees. And that sort of informed some of the Dabs Mila's artwork a little bit as well. And so I said, what if we did sort of a tree themed uh, drum kit? And I sent over a couple of examples and um, Mike just went to work. And he actually didn't want to show me progress along the way. Um, he was like, this thing is turning out so good, uh, I don't even want to show you until it's done. He did tell me about this idea. It's actually just the front head is just a, a block of wood. And I said, I'm just worried about how it's going to sound, right. you know? And, and he's like, just trust us. We're going to send you another, uh, an actual normal uh, kick drum head just in case. But he sent that and I sat down and I played it and I was like, this sounds great. I couldn't believe Somehow. it. Somehow, yeah. When he told me that the drum head was solid wood, I went to all of my friends and I'm like, okay, how's this gonna work? Because with the low freak and the D6, we've got a, 
another boundary mic inside of, but I've never seen a mic or a drum set with a solid wood head on it. Yeah. But I talked to Peacock who came and dialed in the drum toads. I'm like, we'll see what happens. And I remember we dialed in like first 10 seconds, like, okay, this sounds fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, no, that was that was a major surprise. Uh, I wonder how many other drum sets we're gonna see now with solid wood. Well, drum we'll sets. see. I, it also, <laughs> I think this thing took a while to, I mean, this thing's custom made. Right. So I'm really happy with how that turned out. They, just a lot of attention to detail. They kind of engraved their logo here. They also did a couple of other um, engravings on the kit. Um, one of Debbie and I's first, when we first started dating, she took me to uh, where she grew up in, in Texas actually showed me our old high school. We sat on a bench and I carved in our initials. Incredible. So I sent over a photo and um, and they engraved our initials a couple times on, on each of these drums. The throne is basically a tree stump <laughs> um, that's adjustable, you can adjust the height. I've never seen anything like that either. Right. They really went above and beyond on these drums. I think they sound phenomenal. This is the first kit we've ever seen with two on the floor, right? Yeah. Um, that one Mike just threw in. Right. <laughs> He's like, let's give you another drum. And I was like, if there's more drums, I'll hit them. A design element that I have when I'm building studios is I hate seeing cables. I don't know, maybe it's just a cleanliness thing on my side. But uh, the cable structure and cable management in this whole studio is actually underneath the rug. There's floor pockets to the right and left of the kick drum. And we have everything ran through the floor pockets that run down the length of the floor into the control room and then they're capped and stuff so it doesn't bleed from one room to the next. The idea is you kind of just walk in and you walk straight to the drums and you don't have to step over any cables, you don't have to duck under any boom mics or anything like that and um, it's, it's very neat. Very neat, I love that. Another thing that uh, we discussed early on in, uh, in this process is being able to control a session from the drums. Right. Um, and so a couple things that we did, number one, when we're thinking about uh, the idea of working remote, is setting up a camera. Right. Um, so just the other day I did a session with my friend in LA where I recorded drums for his song, and I set up a camera. There's an HDMI port that goes right there. So I set it up right in front of the drums, and then over here I have a station where I can control my computer in there. Um, and so we just, we just sent a cable from there to pull up image on the monitor and um, everything else can be controlled remotely. Also, I can just kind of come in here and operate that computer from right here. I can see what I'm doing, hit record, hit stop, delete everything I just did, record it again, <laughs> uh, and go through that cycle until I'm kind of happy with the take. Fantastic. So the idea that I can come down here and just hit record and play immediately, it frees me up a little bit and it kind of uh, feels a, a lot less daunting to kind of get kind of a session going because I can be upstairs and, and think of something and then just kind of come down here and record it and know that, you know, it's going to sound good, but more important, I can do it immediately. Right. <laughs> now, that's, that was one of the things I focus on most in designing a studio is making it so the artist can get the pen to the paper as quickly and as efficiently as possible without putting a ton of obstacles in the way of that process. I had made the last trip, we had tuned the room, we had dialed in drum tones, and we were just doing a couple finishing touches. I remember standing in the door and looking at you and like, I've had a blast building the studio, but at the end of the day, I have to leave. And it was like this really humbling thought to think of the fact that you just get to walk downstairs and then this is yours. Um, like I said, I, I kind of, well, I, I started playing drums walking to the music store, 15 minute walk from my parents' house, and I did that every day for about a year. And then I played in their basement. I'll play drums anywhere. I, uh, I rented out a, a loft in a friend's warehouse one time, um, and I played there for a while. And so to have a place at my house that I can just play drums at any time of the day, uh, I feel really lucky to have that. I think about it all the time. You know, the idea of kind of moving back from LA, a place where it's there's sunshine constantly, to a place where there's a little more gray, you know, a good, good chunk of the year. To have a place that is personalized, it's, it's bright, it's colorful, you know, it's got windows where the sun can come through, being able to walk down here and record stuff, that there's, there's a, I mean, I think that's priceless. Awesome, well hey, thanks again for having us over. Thank you.